times when my faith is in the drought Your grace is enough when I lack trust I believe, yeah I believe From the trials of everyday life to false prophets Or using the gospel as a means to gain profit They all stay knocking at the door of the heart Like grocery carts, you leave empty just the way you start so stand firm like Job through the test of faith. Whatever you face, know he is our strength, so don't flake. Don't and flake. don't be swayed by the wind of new doctrines. They all look appealing but to the body is toxic. I used to speak as a child and think as a child until I put away childish things and reasonings. Now I think like a man. Admit when I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Get biblical wisdom, not advice from Steve Harvey. Now I see in part and things may look dim But struggles produce faith when we hope in Him the Lord. Though I plan everything I won't understand That's why I leave it in the hands of the God Well welcome to what is now the final week in our series Why are we here? Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about our purpose as a church, and as we look to a new day and a new uh, step in, in our history and journey, what are we here for? Our vision, helping people live Jesus-centered lives, is the, the why behind everything that we do, the why behind all of our steps going forward. You know, this past week, I had the, the blessing to go with Pastor Allen and, and Carrie Offord to the Church of God Convention. This would be, a, you know, the gathering of all of our pastors like myself across the great nation. And, you know, they, they picked the best place on earth to have it, too, right in the middle of Kansas. They could have picked anywhere on the map. They said, I think Wichita is the most fun we could have as a movement. And we went... Whatever, okay, so, so I spent a week in Wichita, but it was actually, it was a really good week. Our, our general director, Jim Lyon, gave some uh, State of the Union sort of messages to us to talk about we as a movement together, all of our churches in the Church of God Anderson, what does it mean to look forward to the next hundred years? Very similar to what we're doing right now. We also had some fantastic speakers there was a, a woman who, who leads the Salvation Army now, and you know she came out and she talked about how the Salvation Army is battling against sex trafficking in our day and age, and what they're doing, and it was encouraging and inspiring. There were several Church of God pastors who got to stand up and speak. There was even a man, I don't know if you've heard his name before, <clears throat> Nick Wojcik. Nick Wojcik was born without arms, without legs, and... His story, his testimony was just amazing. As, as they put him on a, a platform on stage and he walked, you know, using his nubs across the stage. I mean, you, you paid attention when he talked. And he told his testimony about how he had expected that God would do something in his life differently. And he prayed, God, why don't I have arms? Why don't I have legs? But instead, God gave him a platform where he has spoken to millions of people in high schools, presidents, just such an awesome story. But for me, the person who I paid the most attention to was a beautiful woman who was 90 years young named Miss Ann Smith. And like Nick, she couldn't get herself up on stage. They had others help her come up. And while some of the speakers had used big hand gestures and you know pregnant pauses in their messages, Miss Ann sat in a chair in the front of the stage and as she looked at her notes and changed, her, her hands shook, not because she was afraid of public speaking, but as a reflection of the battle she had faced in her life. And she began to tell a little bit of a story about her life, about how a number of years ago, there was this new young pastor at her church, which was in Anderson, Indiana. This new young pastor's name was Ed Nelson. Perhaps you've, you've heard of him before. And she said, this, this young upstart pastor, he came and he brought a new style of worship to the church. She said she struggled for weeks, missing her old hymns, missing uh, you know, what she had grown up used to. And then she began to say something I thought was just so powerful. She said, you know, I started to consider leaving that church. But as a, as a mature believer, she took that question to God first. God, are you releasing me from this church? And, and what she said she felt from God was, Anne, are you coming to services with expectations? Or are you coming with an expectancy that you're going to meet with me? Are you coming with expectations that have to be met? And if those demands aren't met, you're going to leave unfulfilled. 
Or are you simply coming with an expectancy that my presence will be in this place and lives will be changed? She said it changed her heart, it changed her outlook. And so over the next few weeks, she, she continued to come to Pastor Ed's church. She said at first, her heart hadn't changed a whole lot. She still felt, you know, this isn't my style anymore. This isn't maybe my church anymore. But as the weeks progressed, she said one week in particular, she saw this young family that she had never noticed in the church before. And she began to watch as the worship music blessed them. And as it did... She felt something in her heart stir. And so over the course of several more weeks, she began to feel God blessing her. But the core of her statement stuck with me. Are we coming with expectations, not just into a church service, but in our marriages, as we parent, as we go to work, as we relate with friends, Do we bring expectations that must be met or do we simply come with an expectancy that God can invade and reshape every moment and reclaim it for him? As we walk through to the end of this series, one of the threads that we've been talking about is why we are here, our vision of helping people live Jesus-centered lives, but perhaps in that we bring an expectation We bring ideas. We bring our own list of things that we want to see happen. I know I do. But what would it look like if we came with an expectancy that God is going to invade our city, that he is going to change the lives and the destinations of those who are far from him? And so this morning, I want to address a few expectations that perhaps have been in the church for years. Because as we talked about, not during this series, but our previous series, The Death of Worry, this is a very relevant idea. The Pharisees had expectations of the Messiah, and when Jesus didn't meet those expectations, what happened? They said, you're not meeting our expectations, and so we are getting rid of you. What could have happened if they said, we are in expectancy of what the Messiah might do? So let's talk about a few expectations. There's one in the church that has progressed for a number of years, probably the last 20 years or so, and that's that programs make disciples. We've been talking over the last couple weeks about the Great Commission, Jesus' final words on earth, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, of all people, of all ethnicities. Wow, that word did not come out right. (laughs) The expectation that the church has had is, what if we just create another program? What if we just add a Wednesday night? What if we just add another Bible study or Sunday school class? Or or what if we just open the doors one more time? But the reality is, programs have never made disciples. Disciples make disciples. Programs can help. But if it's not a relational process from start to finish, it's not gonna leave the impact that we had hoped for. And so I want you to turn somewhere in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What may perhaps be one of the most dangerous passages of expectancy that's out there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse one, the apostle Paul says this, he says, And you should imitate who? Me, just as I imitate Christ. You should imitate me, just as I imitate Christ. Those words challenge me. Because he's not saying, hey, go imitate Jesus. He's saying, I should be a representation of Jesus. And so the reality is, as we live our lives with Jesus at the center, then we can help others learn and see what it means to live a Jesus-centered life. Last week, we put it this way. The relational process is, I do, you watch, we talk. I do, you help, we talk. You do, I watch, we talk. And then you do, I cheer, we talk. 
Notice what the last two words of every single step of the way is. We talk. Disciples make disciples. We can have great programs that can bring a crowd, but it takes a one-on-one investment or a one-on-ten investment to really make disciples. A second expectation Oftentimes in the church, and this is one you heard me address when I candidated. This was the, the message that I brought. But the expectation is often it is the pastor's job, or at least primarily the pastor's job, to make disciples, right? That's what we pay you for, after all. And yet, Ephesians chapter 4, if you want to turn there somewhat quickly, Ephesians chapter 4 gives a job description for pastors, for leaders in the church, Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 12 says, Now these are the gifts that Jesus gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastor teachers. Their responsibility is to help God's people do his work and build up the body of Christ. Their responsibility is to help God's people do God's work and build up the body of Christ. I told you before, I'm not a math guy. Math and me just do not get along. When my son grows up to the age of about seven and he's in math that's higher than I've accomplished, I'm going to be in trouble trying to help him. But there are some things in math that make sense to me. For example, if one person is responsible to do all of the ministry in a church, how much ministry can be done in the church? Very little. Some sociologists have done some studies and found that roughly in any average person's life, there are give or take 10 relationships that they can pour into at any given time. 10 relationships that they can engage deeply at any given time. So what can happen instead if the pastors in the church equip the saints to equip the saints. And it's not just one-on-one anymore, but it's 10 people who change the lives of 10 people who change the lives of 10 people. Because studies are showing that around only 20% of all Americans will attend church in an average week. That's one in five. Slightly less than that, around 17% of the average Christian will read their Bible in an average week. Something we learned this week that kind of scares me a little bit, 80% of the average Christians in, in, in a congregation will look at pornography in a week, and only 17% will read their Bibles. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so here's how the math works out. Let's say that you are one of the 20% who attends church. You're here roughly four to five hours in a month. Four to five hours in a month. Let's just say that was the relationship you had with your wife or your children. Honey, I love you so much. You're getting four hours of my life this month. Use them well. Whatever you want to do with them, we'll go on dates. You know, we can go to the movies. But you get that four hours, sweetheart. It wouldn't work, right? In an average year, that works out to around 26 to 40 hours 26 to 40 hours, that's a little over one day, but a little bit less than two days. So let's go back to that equation. Honey, I love you so much that in the 365 days to come, I'm giving you two of them. What do you want to do with them? We go to the movies, we could do whatever. Do you see how the math just doesn't add up? And yet, we will spend about 2,600 hours on average at work, and roughly about 3,000 hours in our homes, or interacting with our families. 2,600 hours, 3,000 hours, or here's the one that really scares me. If you see the bar that goes all the way off the screen, I don't like to use outdated statistics too much, but in 2012, they released a study that the game World of Warcraft, you've heard of it, it's this big online multiplayer game, that up to that point, 2012, six million collective years had been invested in that game by its players. And that was five years ago. 26 hours a year versus 6 million collective years. Again, I'm not a maths guy, but it starts to add up pretty quick. 
But what could happen if Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 is right and we are all called to the Great Commission? What if each of us is called to make disciples and we start to add those times together, that 26 hours in church, that 2,600 hours at work, where you actively and expectantly ask God to show up, to say, God, allow me to be a witness to those who are around me. Because outside of our families, probably at work, that's going to be the most direct relationship we have. And then, God, what if, what if we add that 3,000 hours that we're at home in there? And we expectantly allow you to show up in our relationship with our children, in our relationship with our wives, in our relationship with our friends and family. We can expect God to invade and reshape the opportunities that we have. And then perhaps we come back here on a Sunday. We get recharged to go back onto what is the true front lines of our faith, our homes, the places we work, the relationships that we develop. I mentioned that we heard a few State of the Union addresses. One of the things that the Church of God is looking at is, are we still in the Reformation business? Are we still here to reform the church? It's probably something you sit awake and think about a lot at night, right? Or are we here, as our general director has said, to reclaim all that hell has stolen? Are we here to reclaim people's lives from the brink of disaster? Reclaim marriages that are falling apart? Reclaim children, friends, family members, and help them live Jesus-centered lives. Jim just says it like Jesus is the subject. But I want you to know, this past week I spent bragging on you guys. A lot of people knew I was, I was here now and a lot of pastors said, Lee, how's Denver, man? I said, Denver's great. I miss the mountains. I'm so glad to be back. They said, okay, well then how's the congregation? I said, look, no lie. We have done things in the last two months that in some congregations I've been in would have taken three to five years to accomplish. We've rebranded the church. We've come up with a new vision statement. We've done some things on the back end that maybe you guys here in this congregation don't even see, but that are helping us to move forward. And I said this, I said, and our congregation is a generous congregation. We've had some initiatives that I've brought forward that I thought, man, this is gonna cost money. It's gonna take us six, seven, eight months to even begin to work on this. And someone here said, Lee, I've got that. I'll take care of it for you. And so we got this new computer back here with new worship software that probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference to you as you're sitting here, but will allow us to move forward and be ready for new technologies, to be ready for the things that we're doing. Before I even came here, while I was still in Ohio, somebody paid for this camcorder that we have so that we can put our messages online and begin to speak the language of the next generation. My son wakes up, Every morning, the first thing he says is, Dad, can I be on YouTube? You can be on YouTube. We'll, we'll record you, buddy. <laughs> and then just a couple weeks ago, we had another person come up and say, Lee, I, I want to pour into our children's ministry. And so a large donation was made to help us move forward with our kids. And now because of that, we're going to be able to get some professional check-in systems in place so that our kids are more secure and we're taking care of those little treasures that are so precious to us. We're gonna be able to begin working towards the orange curriculum, which is something I've experienced the last couple places I've been at and just watching my son interact with the fun that they provide and with the ability for him to memorize Bible verses every week, it's amazed me what we can do through that. But while I was there, I also ran across someone who was here in our congregation last week Pastor Bob from another congregation, and, and he had brought his kids with him here, and so I said, Bob, what do you think? Are your kids going to come back? And he said, you know, I don't know. They're young. They don't have kids. They got money, so they're traveling a whole lot, but he said, I will say this. I want to tell you about the guest experience that I had. I said, okay. Talk to me. He said, I pulled into your parking lot. There was no signage anywhere. I didn't know how to get to your sanctuary. It became very difficult to get inside. And then when I came in, he said, there were these wonderful people who greeted me and welcomed me, and I genuinely felt warmly welcomed to the congregation. But he said, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to identify them, so I didn't know if it was just a person in the congregation or if this was someone I could ask questions to. 
He said, I felt crowded in that little hallway that you have right there. It was, it was hard to, you know, stick around because you got to kind of get out or people are crowding around. And he said this, and this was the one that hurt. Lee, the men's bathroom smelled terrible. I said, I don't think it was my fault this week, but I'll look into it. And so you've been so generous, but we still have a road ahead. We still have some things that we're going to be working on. And I'm so excited because I come with an expectancy that God is going to show up in powerful ways. In fact, this, this last week, I went to one of the little breakout sessions, and I was hosting a table, you know, out of the goodness of my heart, because they emailed me, and I said, sure, why not? And at the end of it, they said, hey, we, you didn't know you were going to get this, but we have a gift for you. Here's $50. I said, I'm coming back to this, this breakout session every time you offer it. Like, I don't care what's going on. I, I, I will make sure that I'm here. And so... I began to get into expectation mode because if you know me, even though, uh, you know, I know in the depths of my heart that living with myself on the throne of my life doesn't end well, that that always leads to purposelessness, hopelessness, and a broken relationships. But every time I get a little money for myself, I go, ooh, I want to see what I can do with this for me. What can I put this into that will make me happy? And literally for a couple days over the, the course of the convention, I, I was having this question in my head, well, well, maybe I could put it towards this. Ooh, or maybe I could buy one of these. Or ooh, Amazon's got a sale on these. And then I heard this, this message, are you coming with expectations or are you coming with expectancy? And I said, you know what? I didn't know I was going to get that $50 anyway. I can waste it on something silly and I, I won't end up filling that void in my heart anyway. I'm going to put it on the plate on Sunday. I'm going to put it towards helping us fix the bathroom issue. I'm going to put it towards, you know, whatever God's leading us to. Because I want to come here with expectancy. I want to come here knowing that God is going to show up for others. Because our guests who come have expectations. And some of them are fair, some of them are unfair. But either way, I want them to have a good guest experience. Because if we help them we can lead him towards that Jesus-centered life. So I want to share just a couple last things that are kind of more state of the union sort of moments than they are a sermon, and I apologize for that. But, but some things that I thought fit well in this thread, some perhaps unmet expectations. You know, one of them that I wrestle with is, is what do we do with this lift project? The elevator, the lift. You know, we... we before I got here, raised $30,000 through the generosity of this congregation. And then we took our plans to the city of Denver and they said, no, you can't do that. You got to do this. And now we're at a spot where we've got to have new plans drawn up. We've got to have new contractors look at it. We've got to rethink perhaps where we're placing this lift. But I don't want that to be an unmet expectation for those of you who, who said, I'm going to make sure we do this because it's going to benefit me. And I want you to know that we've got some meetings coming up to look at that and see what will work best to make sure that we're moving forward with it, even if it costs us a little bit more than we were planning. I also know that there's perhaps some unmet expectations when it comes to to the transition that Pastor Allen is making. One of the things I told the board a couple weeks ago is I said, you know, the transition from Ed to me was softened by the fact that Ed announced his retirement over two years ago. And so I believe that some people in the congregation began to detach from Pastor Ed and began to attach to Pastor Allen. And I think that as he transitions, this is going to be a harder moment for our congregation. And let's not forget that that also means there's a transition in worship. Because just as I am not the same person as Pastor Ed, and so even if I tried to preach in the same way he did, it's going to be different who we bring in, and and Mike has blessed us so much already this morning. He'll be with us for the next five weeks. And then we have someone named Kellen coming from California who's going to be with us perhaps for for a long haul. But even if they tried to do the same songs in the same way that Pastor Allen did, it's going to feel different. And so that expectations versus expectancy kind of hit me hard because change has come. And you guys have managed it so well. At every one of the listening tours that I've done, I I heard nothing, but the the number one thing I heard was, I just want to see my kids and grandkids back in worship. I want to see my kids back here, and I will do anything it takes to do that. And you've lived it. Again, I bragged on you all week, and I am so blessed to be your pastor. 
But as we move forward into this next step and this next day, we have to begin to ask ourselves this question. We know now why we're here. As a congregation, we are here to help people live Jesus-centered lives. But now we have to turn that question into ourselves. Are we going to come with expectations that may or may not be met? Or are we going to come with an expectancy that God is going to show up in powerful ways? And what does that look like? But you know, this question isn't just about being here on a Sunday morning. This is a question that shapes our lives. Are we going to live with expectations of our spouse that they may or may not meet? Are we going to live with expectations of our friends that they may or may not meet? Our children, our job. Not saying you can't end friendships, not saying you can't leave jobs, but are we going to live with expectations that must be met? Or are we going to live with an expectancy that God is going to show up? And so in the next few moments as the band comes up to the stage, this has traditionally been our, our time where the elders will come to the front of the congregation and, and will pray for those who are, are wanting prayer. I want to invite you into a moment where we have an opportunity to live in expectancy of God. And in your marriage, in your walk of faith, in your relationships, your friendships, or your work, if you need that moment of just praying, God, help me to expect only you and that you would show up. I would encourage you to come forward this morning and we will pray for you. And if you need some time just to yourself, maybe somebody does, you don't want somebody to pray over you. We've brought out this little tiny altar here, right? So one or two people can go there, but we'll open up the altars up front as well. And over these next few minutes, can we just engage with God? Allow me to pray for us. And elders, please come forward. Lord Jesus, God, a beautiful 90-year young woman just punched me right in the heart this week. And I don't want to forget the message that you have brought through her. God, sometimes I come to you with expectations. Sometimes those expectations even look like demands. That if you don't meet what I think you need to do in my life, God, that, that that's it, I'm out, or that, that I'm gonna take a step back. God, I wanna see what my life can look like in my relationships and in my relationship with you. If I simply ask, God, I don't know what comes next, but I am expecting your presence to show up. God, help me to live with an expectancy. Jesus, we pray for Pastor Allen as he is probably right now finishing up preaching at the, the Darlington Church of God in South Carolina. God, we are so expectant of what you're gonna do through his family there. I've seen the, the smiles, I've seen the excitement that he and Christina have had this week. We pray that you would bless him. And God, through Mike and through Kellen, and as we transition in this season, God, would we just come with an expectancy that you are ready to show up. You are ready to invade our story and reshape it to look more like you. It's in your holy name I pray, Jesus. Amen. The elders will be at the front of the congregation here. If you would like to come forward and be prayed for over anything, please feel free to come forward at this time as the band sings. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell made history's first complete phone call to his secretary. Just 11 years later, in the fall of 1887, a pioneer by the name of James Pollock came across an issue of the Gospel Trumpet, the primary communication tool of the time for a fledgling movement called the Church of God. Pollock was convinced that the message that was proclaimed in this magazine of, of Jesus being the center and the subject of all we do, of living in holiness and unity, was the message that was needed in Denver, Colorado. And so he sacrificially sent $100, or what would now be $2,500 when adjusted for inflation, to the editors of the Gospel Trumpet, asking them to send a messenger or a company of people to come to our city. D.S. Warner, the founder of the Church of God movement, responded to this call, bringing a group of early pioneers and meeting for six to 10 weeks at a little United Brethren Church off 27th Street. Sensing a continued need for the message and the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
James Pollock continued to pay $75 a month, or what would roughly be $2,000 a month today, to continue to hold meetings and share with the people God misses most what it looks like to live a Jesus-centered life. The challenge of our 130th anniversary is the same as that which was issued by our predecessors at our 100th anniversary, that we would not look to the past, but continue to look to the road ahead. As we enter into our 130th year of making Jesus known in Denver, Colorado, our challenge remains the same as it always has been. We are still pioneers who give sacrificially, doing whatever it takes in the era we find ourselves in to reach people where they are and help them live Jesus-centered lives. Over the course of 10 weeks this fall, we'll gather together for an expedition through our past and into the road ahead. Each weekend, we'll encounter a relevant message designed to be engaging to where you are and challenging where we are going together. We'll also meet in life-changing small groups where we will allow God's story to invade and reshape our story. Ours is a world that is changing more rapidly than ever. But a few things remain the same. We are still a pioneering people who are called to give sacrificially and invest back into our community, making a disproportionate impact in Denver, Colorado. And just as we did at the beginning, we are called to help people live Jesus-centered lives. Won't you join us this fall, starting on September 10th, as we journey together for an expedition through our past and into the road ahead.